Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And in the past, I would have said a welcome to Edgewood United Synagogue Adult Education Programme. But today, I'm pleased to say welcome to the whole of the United Synagogue family, to those who are watching independently, and a special welcome to all B'nai B'rith UK members with whom we are holding tonight's joint meeting. You will be aware that the government moved yesterday's early May Day bank holiday forward to this coming Friday for the whole nation to celebrate VE Day, commemorating the 75th anniversary of the official end of the Second World War. Victory in Europe Day marks the formal acceptance by the Allies of World War II of Nazi Germany's unconditional surrender of armed forces on the 8th of May 1945. Most of the events that were to have taken place this week, both locally and nationally, have either been cancelled or temporarily moved to the weekend of the 15th and 16th of August to coincide with the VJ Day commemorating the surrender of Japan in 1945. In Edgware, however, I would like to think that our motto is nil desperandum, we neither postpone nor cancel. I suppose we could borrow the title from the 1961 British comedy film and tell you that we carry on regardless. We are going ahead not only with tonight's session with its Second World War theme, but also with the rest of our programme to September, all of which you will be able to find on the events page of our website, www.edgewayu.com. We start our new season with a presentation on Projecting Britain at War, the national character of British-made World War II films by Jeremy Havardi, the B'nai B'rith UK's director of the London Bureau of International Affairs, who wrote the definitive book on the subject. He is an author, journalist and historian with degrees in philosophy, history and law. His books include Falling to Pieces, a philosophical study of self-deception, The Greatest Britain, a set of essays on the life and political philosophy of Winston Churchill, Refuting the Anti-Israel Narrative, a detailed and comprehensive critique of the charges made against Israel today, and of course tonight's topic on World War II. I believe that he is currently working on a project that examines the Jewish contribution to modern civilization. His articles have been published widely, including in The Guardian and The Jewish News, to which he's a reg regular columnist, where he also writes books, reviews and features. He is a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. I now have much pleasure in calling on Jeremy Havadi to talk about projecting Britain at war, the national character of British-made World War II films, and if we have time at the end, he will be happy to respond to your comments and to take questions. Thank you very much, Spencer. And again, uh, it's an honour to be able to give this talk in conjunction with um, Edgeway United and Play Brith. And I'm going to talk for about 40 minutes, and as you say, there'll be hopefully a chance for questions afterwards. So what is it that British films can maybe tell us about British national character? Well, there's a familiar joke that whereas they had Germany, Italy and Japan, we had John Mills, Jack Hawkins and Kenneth Moore. And it may seem an entirely light-hearted cultural observation, but it does point to a particular and peculiar British obsession with war films and with the Second World War more generally. And 75 years after VE Day, the Second World War still evokes intense feelings of pride among an elder generation of people. I want to just switch to, I'm going to do this quite a bit actually, I'm going to switch to some images, so just bear with me. Okay, and hopefully now you should be seeing it's images. So, um, which image, images am I talking about? Well, uh, St Paul's Cathedral surviving the Blitz is a very famous one. Yusuf Karsh uh, took that iconic photograph. So it's one of the one of the incredible images from the Second World War. Of course, um, you also have the image of uh, the ships at Dunkirk and the mighty few in the Battle of Britain. And these have seared their way into the British imagination, taking on an iconic status that is almost tantamount to a secular uh, religion. And bestriding them all, is the image of the great Colossus himself, Sir Winston Churchill, who led Britain and inspired the free world from 1940 to 1945. All really are symbols of a time when the British nation was, in my view, more united than ever before in its defiance of tyranny. And the national memory of the war, like the memory of many historical periods, has been shaped by popular culture. Um, including, and these are some examples, novels, television programmes, contemporary photographs and music. But by far the most powerful cultural medium really that we have um, is film. Through its kind of seamless blend of visual images um, and sounds, uh, compelling narrative, film has impressed itself upon us. 
um, and it's left us with unforgettable depictions of the conflict, many of which will be explored in the presentation. For those of a certain generation, um, these actors and their films summon up very deep emotions. It's as if they are Britishness personified, a microcosm of the national character on celluloid. So you'll recognize some of those. Um, Jack Hawkins and John Mills seem as familiar as Monty and Slim, the cinematic embodiment of English pluck, courage and valor. And as one historian put it, Douglas Bader looked like Kenneth Moore, Rommel looked like James Mason, and every RAF pilot should have looked like David Niven. Okay, I'll switch, I'll switch back. So, whoops, you should, you should be able to see me now. Okay, so cinema certainly had what I would call a mass reach, um, certainly during the Second World War. So during the golden age of British film, which was in the 1940s, about 80% of the British population went to the cinema at least once a year, and about 1.64 billion tickets in total were sold. That's about seven, six or seven times more than is the case today. Um, in 1942 and 1943, more than 1 billion cinema tickets were sold in Germany. And in America in the 30s, weekly attendance at cinemas was around 80 million, which is about roughly two thirds of the then US adult population. Um, film is a unique entertainment medium, but it's a lot more than that. It's also the most powerful medium for conveying um, messages, ideas, um, ideologies, national self-perceptions and stereotypes. And if you look at the underlying values of classic Hollywood films, you find defenses of things like individual rights and citizenship, uh, the preservation of property, the maintenance of law and order, the sanctity of the family. I'm talking about the kind of classic era. And this mixture of capitalism, democracy and the rule of law embodies the most cherished values of American society and provides the films with a kind of unmistakable signature trait. So with respect to the great Hollywood producer, Sam Goldwyn, if you want to send a message, you don't just have to use West, Western Railway. Um, well, I think that British films of the Second World War do the same thing by conveying core contemporary stereotypes of the British national character, such as reserve and emotional restraint, a very strong belief in duty, um, a love of the underdog, and the ability to muddle through. And after that, they're influenced by a contemporary zeitgeist, which is much, much more skeptical about war and duty and heroism, and which celebrates um, individualism. And we're going to start by looking at one of the great wartime classics uh, in which we serve. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back and let's have a look. Okay, so hopefully now you should, I think. Okay, and here we go. Now you've got, in which we serve, and you've got two posters there. So you've got one from the British release and one from the American release. And written and projected, sorry, written and produced by Noel Coward and co-directed by David Lee. And the film is really the definitive tribute to Britain's fighting services, particularly the Royal Navy. And it was based around events in the life of Coward's friend, Lord Mountbatten, um, whose ship Kashmir was sunk in the Battle of Crete in 1941. And the film centers around three characters that each represent a different strand of British society. So you have Captain Kinross, who's played by Noel Coward, Chief Petty Officer Walter Hardy, played by Bernard Miles, and Ordinary Seaman Shorty Blake, played by the great John Mills. Hardy is from a respectable middle class background. Mills is a kind of authentic salt of the earth cockney, but the leader of the pack is Kinross, whose character in a way is much like Coward himself. Um, charming, unflappable, the kind of epitome of upper class manners and reserve. And the three are bound together by a ship, which in this film is called HMS Torin, a great symbol of Britain's naval might. And during operations in the Battle of Crete, the ship comes under attack by German dive bombers and sinks, and the crew uh, manage to get to safety, but they cling onto a life raft. And most of the film actually shows um, both them clinging to the life raft, but also flashbacks of their life in which they reflect on their civilian experiences, as well as their earlier experiences on the ship. And from this moment onwards, the men suffer what you might call equal hardship, as they struggle to survive the onslaught of German bombers. And I think that reinforces a very powerful message about social levelling, which was very important to, at that particular time. Okay, let's go back. So that's in which we serve. Now, if you want a film that celebrates the kind of plucky, 
The Victory of the Underdog. The, the film I've picked here is called Nine Men, which was set in North Africa, made in about 1943, and its desert sequences actually were filmed in, in Glamorgan in Wales. You have Jack Lambert, who plays the tough Sergeant Watson, who tells the men under his command about the need for that little bit extra, or what he calls un petit peu in wartime. And he recalls a time earlier in the war when a patrol of which he was commander was attacked in a German air raid. And with their lorry destroyed, Lambert and his men run into a sandstorm in the desert while trying to get to their lines. They stumble across an ancient tomb, which they use for temporary shelter, and they soon find themselves besieged by Italian troops and heavily outnumbered. Yet despite repeated attacks by the enemy, the men are able for the most part to hold out and successfully launch a counter-attack against superior numbers. Eventually they face the enemy in hand-to-hand -hand combat, just when it appears that all is lost, the men are relieved by a British command unit. Um, I think this film is very gritty, very tense, some great cinematography, and really provides a, a superb evocation of the common spirit of ordinary people under fire. Um, Jack Lambert, who is this robust, no-nonsense sergeant, leads recruits from very ordinary backgrounds. And this is a feature of these films during the war. You don't have solid professional military men. What you have is people who are recruited from ordinary backgrounds. In this case, a bookie, a policeman, a cabbie, um, a miner, and a coffee store owner. And they are this rough group that's assembled into a, into a really great fighting unit. And spurred on by their commander, the men form an effective and cohesive fighting unit who really work for each other and show discipline. And in their depiction of the kind of gallant few against the many, the film celebrates that stereotypical kind of British love of the underdog. So that's Nine Men. Now, talking of this notion of the amateur, this is something that's very deeply embedded in, in studies of British character. If you want a film that celebrates the plucky uh, dash of the amateur, the spirit of patriotism, the value of self-deprecating humour and the victory of the underdog, then you can try the wonderful film Pimpernel Smith, which stars Leslie Howard. Again, I'm going to just go back. I'm just going to share some images. This is for those, who, those of you who may know it. Uh, sorry, one second. That's it. So this is Pimpernel Smith starring Leslie Howard. Now, Howard stars as someone called Professor Horatio Smith, who's a rather absent-minded, um, amiable academic, you probably know the type, who worships a statue of Aphrodite. So he's very much, he's very erudite, he knows about the classical world, and he exalts in that love. Yet he's not some kind of detached bookworm. Instead, he has an alter ego, who is a dashing and courageous shadow who rescues people from the clutches of persecution. It is, of course, modelled on the Scarlet Pimpernel. Um, and in one of his most daring operations, and this is, I'm now showing you one of the posters, in one of his most daring operations, he disguises himself as a scarecrow, overlooking a field in which prisoners are being beaten and humiliated by a German guard. And in order to deter the men from stopping work, the guard shoots the scarecrow and promises to do exactly the same to the men. Um, the camera focuses close up on the scarecrow and we see a, gra a small trickle of blood dropping down its arm. So this is a moment which is heavily allegorical, drawing not just on the primal myth of the hero fighting monsters, but specific Christian sources. Yet Horatio Smith demonstrates a very kind of English modesty when confronted with tales of his exploits. He su dismisses suggestions of heroic bravery and is embarrassed at the hero worship that some of his students show him. And he merely tells them he is just a singularly weak person who invariably gives way to his impulses. Now, in this film, his nemesis is the chap here on the left. Um, he's a growling Gestapo officer called von Graum, who is a kind of committed national socialist who worships power and strength and violence and believes that it will rule the world. And what the film does is it ridicules von Graum's kind of jackboot mentality and also his perceived lack of humour. And in one scene, von Graum is struggling to work out the English sense of humour. Uh, which he has been assured is the, English, the kind of great secret weapon of this nation. And he plows through P.G. Woodhouse, and he goes through Punch, and he goes through Edward Lear and Lewis Carroll, and he says they're all unfunny. Um, it's, it's simply not true. There is no secret weapon the British have. And this is, iron this is kind of deliciously ironic because Howard then uses this secret weapon to kind of quite merciless effect. So there is one conversation that they have 
in which von Graum insists that the Bard, that Shakespeare was actually a German writer and that proof has been found to this effect. That may be so, the professor replies, but one has to admit, the English translations are most remarkable. Um, that film was particularly interesting because it actually supposedly helped to inspire the rescue mission that was undertaken by Raoul Wallenberg in Hungary in 1944. So let's go back. Okay. So that is, that's the great Pimpernel Smith, um, which and all these films are, are certainly still available. Now, the stiff upper lip, that sense of reserve and restraint for which the nation was once so famed, was evoked with great sensitivity in another wartime classic right at the end of the war called The Way to the Stars, which is the result of a creative collaboration between Anatoly de Grunwald and Anthony Asquith, the son of the former prime minister, and it offers a poignant tribute to the fighter pilots who sacrificed their lives during the war and was also a stirring tribute to the spirit of Anglo-American cooperation. So this is a film which is told in flashback, looking at key events at an airfield when pilots of the British and American Air Forces lived and worked together. But this drama is not really about aerial combat, it's more about the emotional lives of the airmen, which makes it a, a quite a very interesting film because it really explores how people deal with loss during wartime and dwells on the need to maintain hope despite the imminence of death. Um, Flight Lieutenant David Archdale, played by Michael Redgrave, reacts to the loss of pilots um, by finding solace in poetry. And there's one poem in particular called Missing. And it really sums up the need for stoicism and restraint when handling loss. When airmen die in this film, people react with pauses, with glances, with uncomfortable silences, which convey the reality of death um, indirectly and which seem to have a, a rhythm and cadence all of their own. And this is a very familiar form of restraint that was so quintessentially English for an audience in 1945. Interestingly, films made by Hollywood studios about Britain and its way of life, in many ways do mirror those attempts to depict the British nation. Now, you'll be familiar with one of them, though those of a certain generation will. The most famous is Mrs. Miniver, uh, starring Greer Garson, which is a film about an ordinary British housewife and her family as they deal with the onslaught of the Blitz. Okay. Again, I shall, yeah, I'm gonna stay here. Okay, in the 1950s, um, war films become, or became a staple of a very bright period in British cinema. Now the 1950s is a time of increasing affluence, incomes are rising, the gradual end to austerity, and for half that decade, the avuncular figure of Churchill presides over the nation as prime minister for the second time. Um, but also it was a period of alarm, of uncertainty with the growing fears of nuclear war, thermonuclear war, um, and international confrontation. And I think what you have is a, is a real sense of nostalgia for the wartime spirit of unity and patriotism, because people are thinking it's gradually seeping away. And I think that's part of the explanation for why there were so many wartime films in that period. And I'm going to look at, I mean, there are so many, but I'm going to look at two. Um, I'm gonna again share the screen. And one that I will look at is one of the most familiar uh, films of the entire period, which is The Dam Busters. And this deals with the legendary assault on the Moin Dam in Germany by Squadron 617 using the famous bouncing bomb. Okay, and it features a score by Eric Coates, which again is immensely familiar. Um, the film is structured in two parts. So the first half shows the progression of the bouncing bomb from an experimental stage to an actual workable weapon of war. And the second leads up to the raid itself. And the film is interspersed with documentary footage uh, as well, which you'll notice the moment you see the film. Now, the chap on the left is the actual inventor of the bouncing bomb. Uh, you've got Barnes Wallace there and Michael Redgrave playing him on the right. And Michael Redgrave, as many times before, and I think he's a, to some extent still an underrated actor. I think he's a marvelous actor. He combined great ingenuity in this film with a willingness to muddle through in adversity. He's a patriotic man um, driven to defend his country. And Wallace pursues his invention with a kind of single mindedness that almost verges on obsession. Before the bouncing bomb is approved, he undergoes all kinds of privations and disappointments. He neglects food, he neglects sleep, he battles against red tape in Whitehall, he witnesses failure after failure in the bomb tests. Um, but he does remain quite obdurate, for he says to his wife, 
when you believe in a thing as much as I have believed in this, there really isn't any other work until you've seen it through. And as well as being single-minded, he's possessed of a certain very kind of English eccentricity. He is in many ways the kind of perfect uh, amateur who has an engaging, almost childlike enthusiasm for his project. Now in the film, um, sorry, wrong one. In the film, disappointment, love and death are treated with a certain refrain, with a certain understatement. The deaths of the airmen are suggested by telling visual images, a letter home that will now not be, dis will now be dispatched to the next of kin, a clock wound up accurately but whose owner will never see it, and empty tables in the breakfast room following the raid. Wallace's heroism is subtle and unassuming, and when learning that the operation had been a success, his only thought is to how many fatalities there were, which in itself is a reminder, a poignant reminder of the tremendous sacrifice that these operations actually entailed. So again, another highly significant film. Um, so another staple really of the 1950s war films was what we'd call the POW film, Prisoner of War Dramas, and there are many, including The Captive Heart, Albert R.N. and The Wooden Horse, which are not quite so well known as the next one, which of course is the coldest story. And this is a true story of a daring escape by British POWs from the notorious Sonderlager special camp Colditz in Saxony. And Colditz was situated by a rocky outcrop above a river, making it appear an ideal site for a maximum security prison. The camp is home to a variety of nationalities with French, Polish, Dutch, and British officers all intermingling. But their camaraderie is rather sorely tested when the first British escape attempt clashes with Polish escape plans, leading to their detection by German guards. And really the clear message from the film, I think, is that if each nationality works separately from the others, their plans are unlikely to bear fruit. Um, Colonel uh, Richmond, played by Eric Portman, suggests that they cooperate. And by the end of the film, some home runs or successful escapes have been made by different nationalities. Now, so far, you may have been thinking, some of you, that these films are dominated by a cavalcade of male characters. So where are the females? Well, the females have largely featured in those films in kind of nurturing roles. So they are wives, their girlfriends, their assistants. In other words, it's about domesticity. Um, but not, not all films are like that, and some films buck the trend. So one of them is the great film Carve Her Name with Pride, a film about the life of Special Operations Executive Resistance Fighter Violette Jarbo, who was captured and executed in Nazi-occupied France after undertaking a series of daring missions behind enemy lines. It stars Virginia McKenna, who's still alive, she's 89, and going strong, and that's wonderful. Um, and she plays Jarbo with great skill and sensitivity, um, leaving audiences with a real impression of Jarbo's um, fortitude under duress. McKenna herself would star in another famous weepy from the 1950s called A Town Like Alice, where she plays a young woman who is taken prisoner by the Japanese in Malaya. At least one wartime, that several wartime films had showcased the lives of women, among them films like Millions Like Us, and that showcased the lives of female factory workers. But for the most part, it is very much about commanding characters in male roles. This um, obsessive nostalgia for wartime unity and camaraderie starts to go into irreversible decline in the later section of the 1950s following the Suez debacle. And suddenly, it's no longer unthinkable to question deference to politicians or the military. From this point onwards, films really start to question the old virtues. You know, maybe adherence to duty is gonna lead one down a false path. Maybe muddling through will lead to disaster. And maybe, just maybe, that famed stiff upper lip can start to kind of quiver after all. And no film, I think, is a better representative of this kind of new emerging mood than a Bridge on the River Kwai. So again, gonna, to our screen, okay, and where are we? So, Bridge on the River Quiet. Um, so this is made in, based on the book, by the way, by Pierre Boulle, the novel. And at the core of this um, compelling prisoner of war drama is a conflict between Colonel Nicholson, played by Alec Guinness, who is on the right here, um, brilliantly played by him, and the camp, the camp, sorry, the camp commandant, Saito, played by Sesue Hayakawa. And the film reveals that these two protagonists, despite being on opposing sides, 
are actually driven in some respects by similar impulses. They both adhere to an inflexible code of military honour and are bound to their class. The British prisoners are told that they must construct a railway to aid the Japanese war effort. Despite his initial resistance, Guinness comes to see the building of the bridge as a way of demonstrating British achievement and discipline, believing that his men are best served by a diet of discipline and self-control. In a way, the absurdity of his dedication lies not just in the willingness to help the enemy, but in risking the lives of his men. Going on the sick list is condemned as not military behavior, and he uses his influence to recruit the majority of sick soldiers. Now in the second half of the film, a British commando unit um, led by an American SKP Shears, played by William Holden, prepares a mission, a bold mission to destroy the bridge. The justifiably famous climax, almost Shakespearean in its tragedy, sees Nicholson try to thwart the explosion after alerting Saito to the wires leading to the bomb. But suddenly Nicholson appears to realize his folly and having been injured in an explosion, falls upon the detonator, blowing up the bridge in the process. And it's then left to Major Clifton, played by James Donald, to pronounce his parting judgment on the whole affair. Madness, he says, madness. Guinness embodies actually many of the virtues we've looked at of the, of the kind of masculine hero, a sense of duty, stoicism, self-sacrifice, but they are subverted by an exercise in self-deceiving folly. Such is his kind of misplaced sense of duty that Nicholson becomes an unwitting collaborator with the Japanese, becoming so transfixed by the bridge that he fails to see its ultimate purpose in the war effort. Okay, I'm gonna switch back. Now, that, there are many films, as I say, of the period, there are quite a few films certainly that also start to question war at this particular time. So as we go into the 1960s, this new cynicism, in particular invigorated by the spirit of youthful rebellion against authority, war and traditionalism, is reflected in a growing number of films. So in 1961, Ealing Studios made a film called The Long and the Short and the Tall, which very much re reflects this rebellious phase in British cinema, and in which the old assumptions of deference and social solidarity were being eroded. It's very much a child of the angry new, new wave, a kind of mixture of anti-militarism and, and kitchen sink. Um, and the end result is a very uncomfortable anti-war production, or so at least it seems to me, which offers a very unflattering portrait of the British Army. Now, set in the Burmese jungle in 1942, you have a seven-strong patrol who are specialists in sonic warfare, and they arrive at a remote hut. The unit consists of squabbling, in some cases, foul-mouthed recruits, the worst of whom is the rebellious Private Bamforth, played most memorably by Lawrence Harvey. Bamford's vul vulgarity and his insubordination know no bounds, and he admits without embarrassment that he doesn't go a bundle on all this death and glory stuff. His disdain for war is shared at least partly by Corporal Johnston, played by Richard Harris, and Johnston questions why the units has been sent into battle so under-resourced and describes their terrain as rotten, stinking jungle. It's rather far from glorious heroism. Tensions within the unit are now heightened um, following the decision uh, to kill their Japanese captive called Tojo, who has accidentally kind of stumbled across their hut. And Banforth now defends Tojo against a charge of looting, pointing out, understandably, that one of his fellow soldiers, Private Whitaker, um, is just as guilty of looting Japanese items. So the British have no right to turn on their captive on a charge for which they themselves are guilty. And the use of this rather recalcitrant Banforth to question the morality of more senior figures is in a way a shocking reversal of the status quo and of previous films. Now, whereas some 50s films do grapple with the dilemmas of conflict, um, none provide such a sustained critique of inhumanity in war at this particular stage, and none so vigorously question the purpose of fighting. And you will find similar denunciations of war and army life in films like Sidney Lumet's The Hill and Play Dirty. By the late 1960s, a film like How I Won the War was able to offer a kind of merciless parody of all the wartime conventions that had been built up. And we're just going to go back. Okay. And there you go, that's, that's the poster, which I think in a way already is, is telling you maybe something about the subversive nature of the, of the film itself. Um, so this, this film stars Michael Crawford as Lieutenant Ernest Goodbody, 
who is a rather hopelessly incompetent, naive officer who becomes a liability to the men who serve under him. His task is to take raw recruits behind enemy lines in North Africa in order to set up a cricket pitch um, to impress advancing officers. Good body's ineptitude ensures that most of his men die, though in rather surreal fashion, they reappear as kind of monochromatic ghosts with netting over their faces. Most of the film is told in flashback because Good Body was captured by a German officer. Now, everything about this film is subversive of the 1950s war genre and before. So, for example, a soldier has his legs mangled and is told to run him under a coal tap. Staff officers find amusement in exchanging bubblegum cards of the war. The British soldiers actually shoot down their own planes, with Crawford declaring it as our first great victory. Colonel Grapple tells Gripweed, who is played by John Lennon, that being a fascist is nothing to worry about. Fascism is something you grow out of. Um, Gripweed later complains to the audience when his stomach is blown open. I knew this would happen. You knew this would happen. Blimpish upper class officers, stiff upper lips, unthinking patriotism and deference, they're all really taken apart in this film. So if, you're, if you want to sort of have an interesting contrast between the traditional films of the 40s and 50s and the new wave, then that's a film that I would say you'd find interesting to watch. Um, so there's not much, much not sort of too much longer to go, but I want to talk about just one or two others. So another very kind of somber, and more unsettling film is called The Long Day's Dying from 1968 from the British director Peter Collinson. And this film focuses on a group of foul-mouthed, squabbling soldiers who face the dilemma of how to treat a prisoner of war, rather as in the long and the short of the tall. And when we encounter them first, they're kind of holed up in an isolated country house somewhere in battle-scarred Europe. And they kill some Germans and capture one called Helmut who pleads with them to save his life on condition that he takes them to his own men. And after discovering that the Germans in question are dead, they try to escape across their own lines, only to die rather horribly in the process. At the end of the film, John, who's played by David Hemmings, is gunned down by his own side after renouncing humanity and saying, I have nothing but contempt for the human animal, triumph of the animal, which is war. Stoicism, duty, self-sacrifice, heroism, have no place in this very grim tale of, of death and destruction. Those virtues seem to be a gigantic hoax, hoax which traps men into destroying their humanity. Now there were occasional attempts to kind of recapture the heroic conventions of earlier movies, particularly in big budget films like Battle of Britain, which is 1969, The Heroes of Telemark, which was also in the 1960s, and perhaps most best known, uh, A Bridge Too Far. And the films of the 60s and 70s, however, are rather more largely marked by an aversion to conflict and a rather more deep-rooted scepticism towards authority, in addition to, in many ways, showcasing a great deal more violence on celluloid. An older generation still remembers cinema's great patriotic tribute to the war and the virtues that sustained the population. But today, watching these films, many will feel that they are quaint, they'll feel that they're old-fashioned, possibly even dangerous to a younger generation who has a very different view of the war and of course wasn't reared on the memories of the war. But I think there's no doubt that these films reflected and in their own way helped to shape perceptions of national character. Now I'm aware there are maybe 200 British war films made specifically about the Second World War. There were 200 in my, that I looked at in my book and I could only deal because of the constraints of time with less than a dozen. Um, but hopefully some of those that I've shown are ones that people will be familiar with and they do reflect some of the um, things that I've actually talked about in terms of national character. Um, very finally, um, you may be asking, or some may be asking, is there a kind of Jewish connection here? Is there a Jewish connection to British war films and their relationship to national character? Well, the answer, of course, is yes, there very much is. And not necessarily on a very deep level, so I'm not suggesting that there is some connection with Jewish values or with the Jewish religion in any sense, but certainly there is a connection in terms of those who shaped a lot of these films. So take uh, Leslie Howard, top left. Um, now his, he was the producer, director and star of Pimpernel Smith and a number of other films in the Second World War. He was of partial Jewish ancestry through his father, Hungarian father. The cinematography for that film was overseen by Mutz Greenbaum, who is top right, who was an influential 
uh, Jewish figure in 1920s German cinema. Um, Lawrence Harvey, bottom, bottom left, star of The Long and the Short and the Tall, was a Lithuanian-born Jew whose birth name was Larushka Skikne. Um, Nine Men was made at the Ealing Studios set up in the 1930s by Jewish immigrant Michael Balkan, uh, who is bottom right. And just some other examples, um, Richard Lester, who is better known for directing some of the Superman films. He directed um, How I Won the War. And the cinematography for the Dam Busters came courtesy of Erwin Hillier. Um, there was a Jewish producer, Sam Spiegel, and scriptwriter Carl Foreman for Bridge on the River Kwai. And there was a Jewish composer called Francis Chagrin, who provided the score for the Colgate story. And I think all I would say on this point is that given the vast scale of the contribution that Jews made to the cinema industry for so many decades and indeed continue to make, I think it's hardly surprising in a way that there would be, there would be so, so many Jewish individuals who would be involved in these films. Take any other films as well, and I'm sure you'll find the same thing. So very finally, if I may, I did mention that I'd written a book. It's called Projecting Britain at War, the national character in British World War II films, where all of these things are discussed in much more uh, detail and I go much more into the sort of history side of things so for those who are interested obviously they're more than welcome to pick up a copy and I believe there's an e-book an e which is also being sold and if I may also very finally um, I just wanted to mention about B'nai B'rith itself so B'nai B'rith the organization I work for is a powerful global voice for the Jewish people we exist in 59 different countries around the world we have 200,000 members and we've been going for 177 years and among the things that we do is advocacy on behalf of the Jewish people, fighting anti-Semitism, fighting for Israel and against the tide of anti-Zionism and anti-Israel hostility that, it, that still exists sadly. We, we stand for minorities as well and we would be absolutely delighted if people wanted to join B'nai B'rith. All the details are on the website b'naibrithuk.org so please, if you, well, if you are a member, please tell your friends. If you're not a member, please do visit the website and we'd be delighted, as I say, to have your support for the valuable work that we are doing. And with that, I will return and hopefully you can see me now. Right. And I'm more than happy to say if people have questions or comments or wish to share their own films, their favourites. If you're not familiar with um, this form of Zoom, there should be a virtual hand there which you can put up to indicate to Phil that you would like to speak or ask a question. Phil, could you indicate where the hand is? Uh, yeah, so you should, depending on what you're using, um, reactions, um, and then you can see a hand. Um, alternatively, um, what can also work is if you want to wave at me, um, I will do my best to try and see who's waving. So I can I see, can see Brian. Brian. Brian is on wait, yeah. I Brian would like Brian. to ask a question. So Brian, Go you're ahead, unmuted. Brian. Go ahead. Um, <clears throat> I just wonder whether uh, Jeremy in his book uh, um, has uh, noted that during the war there were many propaganda films produced, uh, particularly by the Crown Film Unit. Mm -hmm. um, I've been researching a, a, a submarine commander whose medals I've got, and I found that um, during the war his ship was used um, to film a propaganda film, um, his ship was called uh, Sub HMS Tribune, and they renamed it for the film HMS Tyrant. The film was called Close Quarters, made in 1942-43, and um, the participants, the actors, were all serving RN or RNVR men. Um, there were. No Oh. Oh. There was no one there of any note at all. It was, uh, it, it is actually um, reproduced by the uh, Imperial War Museum. You can actually purchase the film. It lasts about three quarters of an hour or so, and it shows a submarine going um, on duty and going under, and eventually, of course, it sinks a, a German submarine. You know, very, very simple. Um, but the message was there that uh, we're going to defeat the, the Germans, the Nazis. I wonder whether you've uh, found any other films of that nature? I mean, I, the, what I actually focused on strongly was um, films for just for, you know, for the cinema, as in, you know, sort of what, you'd, what you would call entertainment films that have a message. 
there's a reason why, I, I mean, I call them sort of, of course they are propaganda films in one very important sense, even though they are films for entertainment, but they do have that, that important sense of wanting to impart information and sharing values and sharing a message. So I haven't really, but I haven't looked specifically at the films that you're talking about, which are the films specifically made as, as propaganda without a recognisable acting system um, but they are very interesting and I think that a separate study would it would be fascinating to compare the content of those films with as it were feature films feature films for entertainment that are trying to sort of deal with the same themes and just seeing doing a cross comparison um, it's and I think you know, that, that may be something you wish to do because obviously um, if you if you found these films and they are available as you say in um, Imperial War Museum I think the BFI as well will probably have a, a large enough number. I think, I think it's a fascinating study just to sort of really compare the techniques and the content of films that are made for propaganda as well as the feature films. Um, Hi. What's, Jeremy, what's your thoughts on Malta's story? Um, I happen to have first-hand experience because my grandfather was a Royal Air Force squadron leader adjutant mm. uh, in Malta. He was the only... Uh, he would have been the only Kohenim on the island, the probably, probably the only Jewish person on the island as well. He served there. Uh, I've seen the film with it's Amit Gillis myself. It's not a particularly great um, of the pedestal operation. It's not a particularly great vivid story. It's, it, it's more like uh, the, the awarding of the, uh, of the George Cross. So I just want, want your, your, your opinion of, the, of that film and if it did actually make into your book. No, I mean, it, it, it did. And I, I mean, I would make one, one point here, which is that I'm, I'm not really so much looking at, I mean, I do look at the visual qualities of the film, the mise-en-scene, the acting, the cinematography. But I mean, my, my entire approach is as a film historian, which is to sort of just look at the film as, as, a, as a piece of evidence for... Yes. How people saw society at the time, how films embedded social values, how they were in a way a mirror for society. And I, it is in there. And I think the interesting thing about Malta's story is that it's a, it is, it is a, 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 I think it's actually a very well-made depiction of an entire island, which in a sense is seen to share the British ability to take it. You know, so this is very much about, you know, the, the British notion that we're not so much meeting it out, but we're taking it and we're surviving. And we are, we've got the backs against the wall, despite the torrent of bombing that's, that's exploding around us. And Malta, as, a, as an island nation as a whole, you know, withstood the force of Axis bombing. And that was why, you know, it was awarded the, the kind of George Cross as a result. And I think, therefore, the, I think the film actually quite effectively does show the ability of that small group of very brave individuals to be able to withstand you know, a very significant period of Axis bombardment. And I, I you know, personally think that the scenes, um, the love scenes with Alec Guinness are, you know, also um, very, very poignant, very effectively done. So, yeah, um, I, I personally did like that film. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it was due for a remake by um, the European Union and in conjunction with um, the Maltese government, there was some funding, but they never got round to it. Mm. Um, so, yeah, so... I'm also, this is, this is my, my grandfather. Oh, wow, wow. Squ squadron leader, uh, Sidney Casper Collins. I have his mention in dispatches and I have his medals. That's fantastic. Um, so he served as a British Royal Air Force officer. Um, he also was in Palestine as well. Right. Uh, and throughout the Middle East, I have his, I'm the family historian. I have his full service records, which I applied for. Uh, when you actually, yeah, I was going to ask, when you actually watch some of these representative films of the period, does that bring back, you know, sort of stirring memories of, you know, of his contribution? Is it, is it a powerful just reminder of, uh, in that sense, of, of his well, duty? From, from my perspective, I have a family made video, which I made in the late 80s, uh, of him talking about his service. He's also mentioned in a, in a book, uh, which is Operation Pedestal. Yeah. Um, there is an autograph copy somewhere around. It does bring back staring memories um, of, the, of the starvation, the, 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 the sheer bombing of the Allied forces out of, into oblivion. They were heavily bombed in comparison to um, the Blitz. They, they took more of a pounding. And if it yeah. wasn't for they were able to retreat into caves, they would never have survived and turned the axis of evil around. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so my grandfather was responsible for uh, the supply chain of anything. 
um, they were virtually starved out. Uh, his, he had an Af uh, air officer commanding, he had several, but his indirect boss uh, was uh, Sir Keith Park. Right. And I've got pictures of him on the square uh, at RAF to Ali, which I have the only station crest that is uh, available. It was mm. give, awarded to him at the end of the war when he left the Royal Air Force Station. So yes, it does stir very fond mm. memories. Yeah. Um, I thought so, and I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm really glad that you've um, you've shared that because um, it's it's wonderful, wonderful story. So thank you very much. Now, Phil, I can only see 25 screens, but we were running forward yeah. 100 so, at one so, time. So, so we, Are there people to... not on these 25 who would like to ask? Yeah. Uh, so, so we've still got 86, we, one. we've got 86 people still connected. Yes. Um, so I can see Valerie and then Stanley. So I'll just unmute Hi. Valerie. Valerie, you should Hi. be muted. Hello. Thank you very oh, much, hi, Valerie. Uh, Jeremy, that was extremely interesting. Thank but uh, recently I saw a programme um, about British war films and also about the various events in the war that actually went wrong, that were hailed at the time mm. as being brilliant sort of uh, advances, but now with historical research, it's been revealed that perhaps they weren't quite so successful as they were originally made out. Now, one of those was the Dam Busters. Right. And this bombing yeah. of Pernabunda mm -hmm. um, was not as successful as it was first thought. Of course, with Barnes Wallace, who actually pioneered the jet engine, I believe, is that right? I think his work actually led to the development of the jet engine. Yeah. Um, I just wondered whether you knew anything about the fact that it wasn't successful. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, um, sure, I, I, from, what I, from what I understand, I mean, I'd have to check this, but the dam was repaired quite quickly. Um, I mean, th th there was extensive damage and it set the Germans back a little bit, but it ultimately oh, yes, didn't completely yes. destroy it. And therefore the Germans were able to sort of carry out repairs. But I think in a way, I think even if we, even if we actually accept that's the case, the film is still making a fundamental point here. It's making a point about the ability to get this done through, yeah, the, the, the determination actually, because really this is about Barnes Wallace's determination to get a project seen through, despite, this is very often in the case in war films, you have a lot of red tape from his own side. British bureaucracy mm. having objections, the British War Office having objections, doesn't matter, he still manages to get it done. It's talking about that, it's talking about the men's willingness to undertake the incredibly dangerous operations um, yeah. by flying over the dam because the, the rate of loss was, was enormously high as we know and it, 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 the film is very much about these men's ability to get it done and their willingness to get the job done despite knowing they may not mm. return and I think also in addition to that this, this poignant sense of, of emotional restraint um, the sensitivity to death which is handled in a particular way and I think all those things are very important but you're right if you're looking at a different angle and how successful actually was the operation, then obviously, yes, it's, it's you know, in that sense, it's rather limited. Right. Would you like to bring Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, thank you very much. So we've got Stanley. Uh, so Stanley, you are muted. Yes, uh, ooh, can't unmute. Yeah, I've lost. <laughs> we can hear you. We can hear you okay. We can't see you, but we can hear you. Okay. Go um, ahead. The question is uh, the film to Brook, which uh, showed a part of um, Jewish soldiers in action. I thought that might have been mentioned. So which one? To Brook. Oh, to Brook. Right. Okay. Um, was that? No, I'm just trying to think. Uh, was that I, I, made by a British studio? Um, it's not one. It's not one that I must admit that's in the book. And the only reason I can think of that is it. it it possibly falls outside of the definition of a British war film. Now, it's, this is very controversial because obviously this is very much about a you know British operation in Tobruk. But but I'm I'm it's very complex about how you actually determine what a British film is, and a lot of it is about the studio, and a lot of it is about the actors, and a lot of it is about the directors and the producers. And there's no simple answer to what really constitutes you know a, a British-made film. So the only reason I can think why it wouldn't have been mentioned is because it didn't quite fit enough criteria. But um, maybe you can tell us more about that film if that's one of your, if that's one of the ones that you think is quite special. Well, it's special because it was a long range desert group attack, which was uh, where they recruited uh, Jewish um, Jews who were German from uh, now Israel, 
mm. I refuse to use the P word. Yes. And um, put him into German uniforms, knowing full well that once captured, they were not prisoners of war. They'd be shot straight away. Yeah. And undertook the job on raiding Tobruk, which the film portrays quite well. Mm. And, and the other film, which is an idea of a Jewish officer, Ewan Montague, the man who never was. Yes, that's a, that's a film which is one of my personal favourites, actually. Um, Ewan Montague, you know, a brilliant, brilliant barrister who comes up, in, it's him and somebody else who come up with this wonderful idea of you float a dead body off the coast of Spain, knowing it's going to be picked up by German, well, by sort of pro-Nazi agents, and then eventually that, that it will get to Hitler. And the body, of course, contained um, f a false plan, a false plan or a deceit deceitful plan for an operation supposedly off, off Greece rather than the real one. And it's, it's, I think it's a wonderful example of the type of film which it is, which is a mixture of kind of espionage and war. The, the, the kind of ingenious boffin-like attempts to try and deceive the enemy. And I think it's, it's one of the best examples of that film. Um, yeah, very, very watchable indeed. And we'll thank you very much for a very interesting talk. We'll take okay. two more questions. Phil, could you choose, please? Well, yeah, there's no more questions. No more questions. Uh, there's no more questions currently, but if anyone um, wants to wave at me, I'll just skim through the four pages. Um, take the light. Anyone else? I'm just, just looking now. Yeah, I can see we right. have someone else. One second. This is the okay. last question. Okay, Michael, you're on. Uh, just a comment about the, the Dam Busters raid. Yes. The latest information seems to be that although it didn't work as far as one thought it would, because it was a German prestige project to have the dams, they diverted a huge number of people to rebuild it. Mm. The ones who would have been reinforcing the Normandy beaches. So it did work, but from a different angle, it meant that when the Allies landed on D-Day, there were a lot fewer fortifications. Yeah, uh, yeah, and I, I agree. Actually, I think from that point of view, you know, you could certainly argue that it was, you know, that, that it had success. Um, so it all depends on sort of the angle you're taking. But yeah, I think that's a good point. Right. Well, it remains for me to thank Jeremy Havadi for a most informative talk, which reflects his expert knowledge on the topic. When other films are long forgotten, we still regularly watch World War II films on our screens. Uh, this week alone, on, we have on terrestrial television, Odette, Reach for the Sky, The Desert Fox, The Wooden Horse, all from the 1950s, and Operation Daybreak, and f a film that uh, you mentioned, A Bridge Too Far, from the 1970s. And we regularly find screenings, besides the, those Jeremy has already mentioned, of, th of films like Sink the Bismarck, The Great Escape, Dunkirk, The Guns of Navarone, Where Eagle Was There, and many more. Jeremy has skillfully shown us how World War II films have reflected the times in which we live. So I suppose that the next batch, made from now onwards, will revert to the stiff upper lip genre. How many times have we heard in the last few weeks the similarities between our current war on the coronavirus plague and World War II? Well, one, one thing I can tell you, we won't be singing, let's all go down the strand in case of an air raid. That definitely would break all the current rules on social distancing. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jeremy, for agreeing to front our first live stream session, and we look forward to further joint meetings with the Brith. Our next session will be in two weeks' time on Tuesday the 19th of May, at the same time of 8 p.m. during Mental Health Awareness Week, oh, when, yeah. jo when Johnny Benjamin, MBE, the award-winning mental health campaign and film producer will give a talk on The Stranger on the Bridge, My Journey from Suicidal Despair to Hope, and his father Michael will discuss how mental health issues can impact on families. I look forward to welcoming you all back to our program on Tuesday the 19th of May, and until then, look after yourself, keep, stay, keep safe, stay healthy, and keep up the current community spirit. Thank you all very much for participating. Thank you very much, Spencer. Thank you, Jeremy. If anyone would like to um, watch the recording, as I know not everyone could join, we will be placing that onto the YouTube channel. Um, if you subscribe to Edgeware United Synagogue on YouTube, then you'll be notified when that video and any other videos are placed up there. And could, you thanks, unmute, everyone. could you unmute us and then we can all applaud the... Of course. There we go. Everyone is unmuted. Yay. Thank you.
Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, Jeremy. Well done, mate. Fascinating. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Very interesting. Excellent. You can't that. You can't that. Stop the recording now. <laughs>